guys, welcome back to my channel. Nice to have you on the show. Thanks, Rosie, nice to be here. Yeah, um, I'm so glad we could get you here after such a busy schedule. I know you're busy. You could barely afford my fee. I know, it was, it was a struggle. I'm so pleased, you're such a big YouTuber. Oh, thanks. I'm, I'm honored to have you on my small time Should channel. Should be. I'm gonna do a lot for this channel. You need it. And today we're going to be doing a real talk about living with OCD and I've called it living with OCD because even though I don't have OCD I get to live with it hey I'm not the epitome I'm not like a the personification of OCD no that's correct but we do we do both live with it you're putting me in a box a box labeled OCD lots of people ask me all the time um, how is it living and coping with versus OCD fine it's not hard in any way for me I don't find it hard. It did take some getting used to. I did have to um, learn a bit about your OCD and understand it a bit more, but actually, I don't feel like, we've got to the point now in our relationship where I don't feel like I have to cope living with your OCD, I just live with you. So, Rose is clinically diagnosed with OCD, and I was trying to think about this earlier. I can't remember when you told me you had OCD. It wasn't the first date, so I don't know when you told me. It is actually the way I pick up women. They call me Rose. Rose CD. I like what you did there, Rose CD. I didn't do it at all, that's my nickname in college. No, it wasn't. Yes, it was. <gasps> they called you Rose CD? Yes. My closest friend. Oh my god. <laughs> did you worry that it would put a partner off you? No, not really. I don't feel in any way um, like it could put someone off me, so to speak. I just feel like OCD has become a part of who I am in terms of my perfectionism, in terms of my creativity terms of my physique. So you're saying it's um, it's o only helped you in the positive? It destroyed my life in my early teens and late teens, but now I feel like I've used it to be a positive thing. So you've, you've learned how to manage it to turn it into a positive tool? Yes. Sometimes, having said that, it does get on my nerves when I can't concentrate on a new project unless the whole house is perfect with that, everything. That in annoys place. me as well. That really does it. Yeah. Really? Well, yeah. you happen to live in a really clean house, so how much does it really annoy you? I mean, that is a perk. So I think a lot of the misconception comes from the fact that people assume people with OCD only have a problem with germs and cleanliness. So mine actually stems from the slightly darker side of OCD, the the phobias that stem into intrusive thoughts that then lead on to like ruminations, that lead on to guilt, that leads on to a whole circle of like anxiety, depression, and um, again rumination. Yeah. So I think. That's that's where mine started, but it then kind of once I had a grip on that, it now comes out in the cleanliness way. Yeah, that's how it comes out. So it's gone full circle, which is fine because I feel like I can manage that much more. Because when it's done and it's not out of control, then it's done and I leave it. When I have like uh, a problem about sort of moral issues, um, ethics, um, it was much harder because I had no concrete way solution to to. You yeah, know, it's yeah, really know, difficult. Like it's. I know what you mean. I know what you mean because basically you were saying your your OCD started being off a mental thing where you felt guilt, worry, uh, you ruminated over things, you were constantly going over it in your mind. Right. You're saying now that it's manifested itself in cleaning. That's right. fine because you can, even though it's annoying and it's annoying that you have to have everything perfect. At least you can physically do something right. and then carry on. Whereas instead of carrying it around in your head. Right, exactly. And people with OCD have a very hard time with uncertainty, but that's something that I have learned to deal with. So yeah. if I'm doing something, or if I'm thinking somewhere, or if I'm going somewhere, I am I can be uncertain about something, and that's okay. Live with it. Like before, if I thought something, I'd be like, what does that mean? And if I think that, then does this mean this? And how does that affect my moral code of conduct? And what does that say about my my demeanour or my character or my moral character. It was all about morality, which is why I did a dissertation on Dexter the Serial Killer, ethics and morality. So don't you think that if, because you were so concerned with like ethics and morality, that that's actually not made you a better person than anyone else, because obviously we're not looking down on anyone here. I am a better person than most people. But don't you think that helped develop you into a good person because you spent a lot of time self-reflecting, thinking, is this right, is this wrong, what's the right thing to do? I mean, and don't you think, it, okay, that was, an, that was horrible and annoying because you had OCD, but in a way, that's a positive thing because it's good to, not too much, but it's good to self-reflect and think, am I a good person, is this moral what I'm doing, you know, how can I be a better person? That's a good thing to do, it builds character. Exactly, Rosie, but more importantly, I think that because I was so hung up on these things, mm. then 
yes, I do agree that in a sense that I do have a sort of a slightly higher moral code. Is it? I'm not Dexter. What I'm saying is, I do have a heightened awareness of right and wrong. Right and wrong, exactly. And I think in life, I always try and make the best choices, the the most moral, and I always try and be a good person. Yeah. And I think that's okay to take with you after having such a you know chronic few years in my late teens with um, how the world works and understanding you know why bad things happen to good people and why people do bad things and what's different about them and me and what makes people do crazy things and what makes people do great things and it was really difficult for me to get my head around how all that worked and why it was different for people but now I've realised that I am in fact perfect. Do you think that part of it was because you were a teenager and then that's harder because obviously you've got like social pressures also you know you haven't learned all your lessons not that I've learned all my life lessons but you know as I've got older I've definitely developed my character matured so do you think, I think it's partly that? I think you're exactly right I think when you don't know yourself and I'm not even make, trying to make a joke here, this is d genuinely true. Yeah. When you don't have, when you don't have that kind of like knowledge of, of who you are through and through, because as you grow, you do, you know, things happen to you, you evolve mentally, yeah. physically, and you, you know, you take those things on board and you become yourself yeah. when you know yourself. Um, I do think that when you're less, a conf less confident in, in who you are as a person, then things will affect you more. One of my main issues is the fact that I'm so super intelligent that I genuinely think more than other people because I'm so super intelligent. So I think that anything, any moral quandary that it might just go over someone's head yeah. affects me more because I'm so super intelligent. Well that's one way of looking at things, isn't it? That's the only way. They even said to me in my classes, Rose, the problem is you're super intelligent. And I was like, yeah, go on. One of your problems is you're also super attractive. I said, yeah, I know. So they said, you know, you've pretty much got it all, so I was like, yeah. I think from 16 to 19, I had the worst depression of my life, and um, it got so bad that, you know, you, ha you have terrible thoughts about ending your own life, and you know, you might even try it, but um, I wouldn't recommend it, because genuinely, I didn't think anything was going to get any better. I couldn't see a way out, because I couldn't, I, I didn't have the certainty, I didn't have the reassurance that everything was going to work out in my mind, but it genuinely did, and I'm not saying it's going to be easy for everybody, but things do fall into place, and the more that you understand about your condition, the more you can learn to live with it and try and work it for you. Um, I do think a lot of it, it comes down to actually researching it as, as a condition, yeah. and there are so many different levels of it and in so many different areas. I mean, you've got, obviously, you've got cleanliness, you've got irrationality that you think in your mind is perfectly rational and you take an irrational thought and you make a very perfectly rational link to a thought that is totally rational yeah. in your mind and you think well how can you tell me that that's irrational when I've got this evidence of links that makes it a perfectly rational thought and it's breaking that down and realizing when to just say no that's that for what it is this is me for what I am I know myself better than that to, to assume that this irrational thought has any reflection on my, my my character or my actions or even my own thoughts. I should really be a psychotherapist. You should write a book about it. I should. I should be like, you know what? I've suffered. I've been there. If I had any advice for anyone, it's that I think you are stronger than you think you are. Mm, always. That's true. That's so you're always, true. always going to win. Even on the days where I think, do you know what, I'm losing to this condition, new, new. We all have our days, even now, when I'm like, do you know what, I'm anxious, I'm upset, I'm worried, I'm making irrational connections with things that are rational, but are they? You need to understand that when you understand yourself and your condition, you'll understand that things do in fact get better. I feel like Maltese is a psychotherapist on the side. Yes. And also a very high class hooker. Yeah, I feel like that's Yes, well. yeah. I've seen that side of the mm -hmm. Yeah, you wish. I live with your OCD, you've got to live with my clumsiness. No, deal breaker. I think if you are going to live with someone who has any condition like that, or anxiety, or any issue that they have, um, I think the first thing you should do to be a supportive partner is educate yourself about it. So I actually read one of Rose's books about OCD and I think that really really helped because even though you've got OCD so, and you know what that was, the books for OCD still explain why you think the way you do. Mm -hmm. So it helped explain to me exactly 
why things are the way they are and I think now I think that we've got to the stage it's been four years together you know we're married I think if you have an OCD issue and you talk to me about it I think I can be helpful and that's actually quite makes me feel uh, like rewarded and important because I think oh Rose has got a problem with her OCD if she talks to me about it I can make a difference I can help and that makes me feel yeah really good like I can help so Exactly, and I read a book about your conditions so that I could help. Yeah. Syphilis is a serious thing, it's very real. Another thing that I would suggest you do if you're living with someone with OCD as well is not just understand it, but know the triggers because I think that I can recognise almost instantly when you're having an OCD and if I don't get it straight away, I'll, you know, it'll take me a little while but I'll think, oh, you're doing this because of this. Uh, like I can make the connection. I think that as a partner living with someone with OCD it's important to understand the condition just as much if not better than they do so that they, as in Rosie, can mm. see it from like a, an outside perspective and sometimes yeah. that rationale is much more clear to the person that doesn't actually suffer from the condition Yeah. you know as compared to the person who does suffer Who's sometimes in it, yes. it, it can be a bit clouded so I think that's very important. I think that from my point of view um, it's important also to sympathise with the person that you're living with because sometimes if you do have compulsions or compulsive behaviour like mm. cleaning or like ruminating or constantly seeking reassurance, um, it's important to also, you know, understand that it can be a lot, it can be a big burden sometimes on, on your partner. So, yeah. you know, sympathise back big and say, alright, excuse me, you know, you, like you, won't, it. you, you won't put me. a ring on it. You did. Actually, what are you talking about? You put a ring on it. Happy. So that was Real Talk Living with OCD. Anything else you'd like me to film, put it in the suggestions box below. And make sure you like, comment and subscribe to this channel for more. Subscribe! It was alright. No, it wasn't even alright. <laughs>